The combined cost of COVID-19 pandemic and a civil war in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region that ended in November 2022 has left the country long seen as one of Africa's most promising economies struggling to pay its debts. A senior finance ministry said Ethiopia will hold a call with its international bondholders on Thursday as the country is uh, careening towards default, saying last week that it could not pay a $33 million bond payment due on Monday. Non-payment would put Ethiopia, which requested a debt overhaul under the G20 Common Framework in early 2021, on track to default after a 14-day grace period. But in separate comments made to Reuters News on Monday, Iyob Takaling, State Minister of Fiscal Policy and Public Finance, said, Authorities' intention is to remain current on our obligations. Ethiopia also is seeking a four-year loan from the International Monetary Fund, which has said discussions with the government are ongoing and a staff visit to the country is likely to take place early next year. Zimbabwe's opposition has challenged the results of last weekend's elections by-elections, describing them as a sham designed to give the ruling ZANU-PF party a tighter stronghold on power. The Opposition Citizens Coalition for Change, or CCC, also says an obscure political figure, Sangezo Shibangu, who was responsible for removing CCC members from parliament, is not the party's interim secretary general as claimed. President Emerson Manangagwa's party, ZANU-PF, is just 10 seats away from securing a two-thirds majority in parliament that would allow it to change the constitution. Elliot Masote, professor of business at Devry University in Ohio, discussed with me the politics of the weekend and whether ZANU-PF wants to change the constitution. Well, I don't think the constitution can, can easily be changed, you know, because ZANU-PF has a majority in, uh, in, in parliament. A lot of stakeholders are involved always when the constitution is supposed to be changed. And I think that is in the constitution itself. It's just like uh, politics being played that ZANU-PF wants to change the constitution. It has been confirmed by the vice president of Zimbabwe, General you know, General Chiwengwa, that you know, that's not the goal of ZANU-PF. And you know, what is really happening, it's just like confusion mostly from the opposition side. But they don't have structures. They don't have anybody who they can say this is the secretary general and that opportunity has been taken by somebody who is now claiming to be an acting secretary general recalling members of parliament and once you know parliament receives that message of recalling party members they have to act according to the constitution of Zimbabwe. So the blame game is there, of course, that we have a party that so much old and rooted into Zimbabwean politics. I believe 100% that it has infiltrated the opposition to the point where they can actually do whatever they want, like maybe, you know, these recalls. But I don't think it's something we can blame one party. Say the opposition must be organized. They don't have that. Professor, let's talk about this obscure political figure you mentioned. In my, it's Sengezo Shibangu, who declared mm-hmm. himself the CCC's interim secretary general. And who is he? And he is actually making uh, a difference in the on the by-election. Yeah, he he can be genuine because according to to what he said, he said, well, they all know him, the the leadership of CCC, and he was there when. Um, MDC was formed and then CCC was formed. It's only maybe now that they are, you know, with what he is doing, they are claiming that they don't know him. But you look at the leadership of CCC, so to dismiss him without having someone we know is substantive, I don't think that works at all. You know, the opposition brought it to themselves. So why would uh, CCC leader Nelson Chamisa, a former preacher who protested that Shabunga was not a party member and that no expulsions had been agreed, why would he say that? So he should exercise his powers if he really mean it. You know, he's just saying that, you know, because he has to say it. it it's politics. He can't keep quiet. But he obviously knows the person. 
and he can't blame himself for not having a Congress for the party to choose people who are going to be substantive. So he's trying to find a scapegoat and blame this and that. You know, he, he's blaming the Shabangu, he's blaming Zanu PF. The only person he's not blaming is himself, which is not being a good politician. And lastly, Professor, uh, uh, President Emerson Mangagwa's party, ZANU PF, is just 10 seats away from securing a two thirds majority in parliament. Uh, that would allow it to change the constitution. You think they are going to get uh, the majority and then actually change the constitution? You think that's, they're heading that way? Well, I think definitely they are going to get the, uh, the majority. But, you know, changing the constitution, as I said before, I don't think it's an easy thing. That depends with only parliamentarians, you know, a lot of stakeholders are involved in changing the constitution. They need to change the constitution. And what part of the constitution do they want to change? Some people have said, well, they want to extend uh, the term of the president and the vice president said, no, that's not going to change. So I don't know what part of the constitution, you know, may be changed because they have the majority, but I don't think that's the goal for Zanupi. They will definitely enjoy the majority and do whatever they want, but not touching much of the constitution, because I don't think some people in ZANU-PF want to go that way. That was Elliot Masote, professor of business at Devry University, speaking with me from the U.S. state. Kenya is out of the danger of over-indebtedness, claimed its president William Ruto on Tuesday, praising his economic policy despite public anger at tax hikes and subsidy cuts. The country of 53 million inhabitants, the economic powerhouse of East Africa, is now out of danger of over indebtedness, said the head of state in Nairobi at a public ceremony marking 60 years of independence for the former British colony. He said, We have made the right choices, sometimes taking very difficult and painful decisions to steer Kenya away from the blink of a catastrophic abyss of over-indebtedness and set our country on a new course, he added. William Ruto gave no figures on the current level of public debt, but pointed out that gross domestic product GDP had grown by 5.4% over the past six months. The Kenyan economy was severely shaken by COVID, followed by the shockwaves of war in Ukraine and a historic drought in the Horn of Africa, resulting in empty coffers galloping inflation and a plunging currency. At the end of June, the country's public debt stood at over 10,100 billion shillings, 64.4 billion euros, according to Treasury figures, or around two-thirds of gross domestic product. The cost of servicing public debt has risen sharply with the corrupts of the Kenyan currency and in June 2024 Kenya must also repay US dollar 2 billion in euro bonds. After his elections in August 2022, William Ruto introduced a series of new taxes going against his campaign promises. Opposition protests against these new tax measures were organized between March and July, resulting in dozens of deaths. The head of state also reduced the subsidies, notably on petrol, introduced by his predecessor, Uhul Kenyatta, claiming that he preferred to subsidize production rather than consumption. <laughs> 